All right. Uh, Wendy and Antonio, I think I'll get started if that's okay with you too. Okay, great. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the RNA Collaborative Seminar hosted by the Yale Center for Science and Medicine. Uh, my name is Jesse Mosin, and I'm a graduate student researcher in the Slavoff Lab at Yale. Our center is directed by Professor Carla Neukbauer. She's brought together a team of postdoctoral scholars and graduate student volunteers, including myself, to assist her in realizing the goals of the center. So the Yale RNA Center is comprised also of 60 faculty spanning many departments. And one of our main goals is to host events that involve trainees in our collective pursuit of RNA science. Um, we work really hard to harbor an environment where trainees not only feel welcome, but one where they're encouraged to participate, ask questions, and through this participation, advance their own career development. So today, we're really lucky to have two excellent scientists speaking today. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Wendy Gilbert. And Wendy studied under Christine Guthrie at UCSF and did her postdoctoral training at Berkeley with Jennifer Doudna. And at Yale, her group studies regulatory elements in messenger RNA that control expression. Our second speaker will be Professor Antonio Geraldez. Antonio did his graduate work at the EMBL with Stephen Cohen and did his postdoctoral training with Alex Shear. He's currently chair of the Department of Genetics and his research focuses on the RNA biology of early embryos. And Wendy, whenever you're ready, I'll give the screen sharing over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jesse, for that nice introduction. And can everybody see my slides full screen? Excellent. So I am really pleased to get to participate in this wonderful RNA collaborative seminar series. Thank you very much for the hotly desired slot to speak today. I'm going to tell you about recent efforts in my lab to reveal the functions of ancient RNA modifying enzymes in healthy biology. And we hope that this work will provide useful insight into how dysregulation of RNA modifying enzymes contributes to disease. So we all know that the amazing differences between different kinds of cells in the human body and in nature are largely determined by differences in the proteins that they express. And so the Gilbert Lab is broadly interested in the fundamental processes of gene expression. And in particular, we're interested in how modifications of RNA contribute to protein production and regulate protein production. So today I'm gonna tell you two unpublished stories about how RNA modifications affect gene expression in human cells. The first story, by postdoctoral fellow Nicole Martinez is about the discovery of pre-mRNA modifications that affect alternative splicing. And the second story, which is the work of a PhD student, Austin Draycott, is about a tRNA modifying enzyme and its role in lung cancer. So my lab has a longstanding interest in this modification, pseudouridine. Pseudouridine is installed by pseudouridine synthases, which catalyze the isomerization of this canonical base, uridine. They rotate the base, so the modified form is attached to the sugar by a carbon-carbon bond, and there's an extra hydrogen bond donor. Pseudouridine has been known as a very abundant modified nucleoside in non-coding RNAs. It was discovered in tRNA in the 1960s. And a few years ago, our lab and several others at the same time developed sequencing-based methods to map the locations of pseudouridine transcriptome-wide. And we applied this pseudouridine sequencing approach to RNA from diverse organisms, including viruses, and discovered that messenger RNA is also modified with pseudouridine. So this is the backdrop to Nicole's postdoctoral work. 
when she joined the lab, she wanted to know when pseudouridine is installed in human messenger RNA. This was an important question because the answer determines which of the many steps in mRNA biogenesis and translation and stability could potentially be affected by pseudouridine. Now, we knew that at least two of the mRNA modifying pseudouridine synthases, PUS1 and PUS7, are nuclear proteins in human cells. And in fact, PUS7 had been identified as a chromatin associated protein. So Nicole hypothesized that PUS1 and PUS7 might modify nascent pre-messenger RNA while it is still associated with the chromatin. And if this was true, this timing would endow pseudouridine with the potential to affect nuclear RNA processes, as well as everything that came downstream. So the approach that Nicole took to answer this question is pre-mRNA pseudouridated co-transcriptionally. She started with a biochemical fractionation. She purified the chromatin from human hep G2 cells and isolated RNA from this chromatin fraction. Then she treated the RNA with the carbodiamide CMC. And this creates a covalent adduct on the Watson Crick face of the pseudouridine nucleoside. And that bulky adduct will block reverse transcriptase enzymes if you use the pseudouridine containing CMC derivatized RNA as the template. And we had shown then you could use this approach to map the locations of pseudouridine with single nucleotide resolution. So this was Nicole's strategy. And I'm showing you on the top left an example of a pre-mRNA pseudouridine site in the pre-mRNA encoding the ribosomal protein RPL7A. So here you can see the read five prime ends in the pseudoseq library. And this is the plus CMC sample where we see accumulation of reads at pseudouridines. And for every experiment, she prepares a mock treated sample where the RNA hasn't seen CMC. On the bottom, I'm showing you the combination of these two data. This is the pseudoseq signal, which is the reads that are CMC dependent, normalized by the reads in the negative control. And Nicole performed 11 independent biological replicates in order to identify reproducible CMC dependent RT stops as pseudouridine sites. So using this strategy, she identified more than 4,000 pseudouridines in the chromatin-associated nascent pre-messenger RNA. And this was hugely exciting. No one had seen pseudouridines in introns before because we and our colleagues in other labs had all profiled mature spliced polyadenylated RNA. We think that this large number of pseudouridines that Nicole identified is actually just the tip of the iceberg. And the reason I say that is because Nicole was only able to look at very highly expressed genes because she required very high read coverage in 11 independent replicates. So this total represents about 1% of all possible uridine positions that she's examined. So are the intronic pseudouridines that Nicole discovered in a position where they could affect alternative splicing? Here I'm showing you on the left, the distribution of all of the uridines that met the read coverage. So she could interrogate their modification status. And on the right, I'm showing you where the pseudouridines were found. And very excitingly, what Nicole saw is that pseudouridines were significantly overrepresented in the introns that flank alternatively spliced cassette exons. They were also overrepresented in other kinds of alternatively spliced pre-mRNA, and they were significantly underrepresented in the introns flanking efficiently constitutively spliced exons. So this was cool. This said the pseudouridines that she discovered were not all over the place. They were strongly skewed towards alternatively spliced regions of the pre-mRNA transcriptome. She also saw that the pseudouridines tended to concentrate close to the splice sites. They were significantly enriched within 500 nucleotides of the splice sites. 
And this was also encouraging to her because this is a region of pre-mRNA that's known to contain a lot of splicing regulatory elements. So the pseudouridines are placed in locations that are enticing to think about alternative splicing, but does pseudouridine actually have an effect on pre-mRNA splicing? To answer this question, Nicole took a biochemical approach. She prepared pre-mRNA splicing substrates that were either unmodified or contained a single pseudouridine in an intron at a position that she had identified in vivo in cells. She incubated these two RNA substrates in nuclear extracts that are competent for pre-mRNA splicing, allowed splicing to proceed, and then looked at the products by RT-PCR. And she found that inclusion of this single intronic studiuridine was sufficient to increase splicing efficiency in extracts from two different mammalian cell lines, jerkets and HeLa cells. Okay, so what about in vivo? To answer this question, does pre-mRNA pseudouridine have an effect on splicing in cells? Nicole first had to figure out which of the 13 human pseudouridine synthases are responsible for modifying the pre-mRNA. And so to answer this question, she took advantage of a high throughput in vitro pseudouridation assay that had recently been developed in the lab by another postdoc, Thomas Carlisle. In this experiment, we make a large synthetic library of short RNAs. In this case, thousands of RNAs that flank the locations of pseudouridine sites, which Nicole identified by profiling RNA isolated from the chromatin of cells. She then incubates this library of RNAs of potential substrates with purified recombinant human pseudouridine synthase protein. After this incubation, then she performs pseudoseq to see which enzyme modified the candidate target site. Okay. So on the right, I'm showing you just two examples of what this data look like. So on the top, this is a pre-mRNA site in the GPC3 gene, and it's a PUS1 target. So only when the RNA is incubated with purified PUS1 and then treated with CMC, does Nicole see a peak of reads. There's no reads in either the absence of pseudouridine synthase enzyme or the absence of CMC. And this is another example of a pre-mRNA that is modified in this case by pseudouridine synthase 7. So overall, we found that at least 10 out of the 13 human pseudouridine synthase proteins modify pre-messenger RNA, with PUS1 having by far the largest number of targets, but our PUSD1 and PUS7 also have very extensive pre-mRNA pseudouridation activity. Okay, so Nicole prioritized these first four pseudouridine synthases for genetic functional characterization in human cells. NE stands for nuclear extract. This is the reason that I say there are at least 10 pseudouridine synthases that modify human pre-mRNA because Nicole, Amanda, and Xu Ting tested nine out of the 13, but there were some sites that were only modified in nuclear extract, but not by any of the purified pus proteins. Okay, so PUS1 had the largest number of targets, and so Nicole looked at this enzyme first. She used CRISPR-Cas9 to make a PUS1 knockout cell line, and then ask what happens to alternative splicing in the absence of PUS1. So here I'm showing you an example of a pseudouridated pre-mRNA, where there are two pseudouridines in the intron downstream of an alternatively included exon. And this exon tends to be skipped more often in the PUS1 knockout cells compared to the wild type parental cells. Nicole analyzed changes in splicing transcriptome wide. She looked for splicing events where the difference between the PUS knockout and the wild type was at least 10% in terms of the percent of the alternative exon or spliced region that was included. And she set a false discovery rate cutoff of 5%. She sequenced two independent replicates rather deeply, and she identified almost 3,000 PUS1 
dependent changes in alternative splicing. The largest number of alternative splicing events were cases like the example I showed you of SFS3, where an exon is skipped or included depending on the genotype, but she, she also saw different types of alternative splicing events. To look at additional pseudoiridine synthesis, she made stable shRNA knockdown cell lines. And she did this because RPESD4 is essential for human cancer cells to grow in culture. And here again, she identified a wide array and a large number of alternative splicing events. And she's just getting ready to look at the fourth pseudoiridine synthase, RPESD1. And quite excitingly, the pus dependent alternative splicing events were distinct. And so this is consistent with the fact that these pseudoiridine synthases don't cross modify their pre mRNA targets in vitro. They have unique targets and they have unique and distinct effects on alternative splicing in human cells. And so what Nicole has shown is that there's a vast potential for pseudoiridylation of pre mRNA to regulate human gene expression by affecting nuclear pre mRNA processing. She showed biochemically that pseudoiridine is installed in nascent chromatin associated pre mRNA and using a high throughput in vitro pseudoiridylation assay, she implicated several pseudoiridine synthases as predominant pre mRNA modifying enzymes. And she showed that a single intronic pseudoiridine is sufficient to affect splicing outcome in vitro. And so in her own lab, which she will be starting in January, she plans to investigate the mechanisms by which these single modified nucleosides affect splicing outcome. Okay, so now I wanna switch gears and tell you a really brief story about a different modified nucleoside, dihydrouridine. Dihydrouridine is installed by dihydrouridine synthases, abbreviated DUS, and these enzymes reduce this double bond in uridine to make dihydrouridine. Now, something that's very interesting about a dihydrouridine synthase, DUS2, is that it was previously shown to be expressed at elevated levels in lung tumors compared to healthy lung tissue. And furthermore, the patients whose tumors expressed high levels of DUS2 had worse survival outcomes. So what do we know about DUS2? DUS2 is one of four dihydroiridine synthases in humans, and it has um, the typical catalytic domains that are present in all DUS enzymes. And then it also has a C-terminal double-stranded RNA binding domain. Work from Eric Fizicki's lab at Rochester showed years ago that the yeast ortholog of DUS2 modifies 15 cytoplasmic tRNAs at position 20 in the D loop of the tRNA. Okay, so Austin wanted to understand what DUS2 could be doing and why it might be important for lung cancer severity or progression. And because the yeast ortholog was known to modify tRNA, his first question was, well, how does DUS2 affect tRNAs in human lung cancer cells? So he made a DUS2 CRISPR knockout. This is, he did these experiments in A549 cells, which is a commonly used non-small cell lung carcinoma cell line. And the CRISPR knockout, um, after the first 17 amino acids, he sequenced the DNA from this knockout clone, the reading frame shifts out of frame and only a tiny little stub of DUS2 is, is synthesized. So we think this is a complete null for DUS2 function. So then he used these cells to sequence the tRNOME from the knockout cells and the wild type cells. And for those of you who know about the difficulties of sequencing tRNA, he used a method pioneered by Tal Pan's group where the tRNAs are first demethylated to allow efficient cDNA synthesis. So what I'm showing you in this graph on the x-axis is the log to fold change in the abundance of a tRNA species. Each dot is one tRNA. Um, the log two fold change in the dust two knockout compared to wild type. And on the Y axis is the negative log 10 of the false discovery rate for this change in abundance. 
And so you can see over here, there's this cloud of dots, tRNA species whose levels were reproducibly and significantly reduced when the cells lacked dust too. And interestingly, these are all isodecoders for cysteine GCA. So if you recall in humans in particular, there are multiple distinct tRNAs that have the same anticodon. So they decode the same codon, but the body of the tRNA is subtly different. And that's how Austin was able to map his sequencing reads uniquely to these different tRNA isodecoders. In parallel, he also looked at the transcriptome scale at charging of tRNAs, and there was no change in the relative efficiency of charging. So the big thing that happened in the dust two knockout cells was all the isodecoders that encode the cysteine GCA tRNA were down. So next he wanted to know whether this magnitude of depletion of cysteine GCA tRNA is functionally significant. And so to answer this question, he made a reporter where the CMV promoter is driving an odd engineered RNA. It first has repeats of cysteine codons. So there's a flag tag and then five cysteine codons, an HA tag and five more, a V5 and five more. So 15 cysteine codons in total. Then there's a viral P2A sequence, which separates this polypeptide from the firefly luciferase. And Austin did that because he thought this weird protein sequence might affect FLUC activity. So FLUC activity in these cells tells you how easily do the ribosomes get through this cysteine-rich sequence to produce FLUC. Now the reporter also has an internal ribosome entry site, which allows independent translation of a ranilla luciferase. And Austin used this as a normalization control. Okay. And so what he found was that the dust two knockout cells had difficulty translating these cysteine repeat reporters. And so he did these experiments in two independent dust two knockout clonal cell lines. And he looked at both TGT and TGC cysteine codons. Now, importantly, these are both decoded by the same cysteine GCA tRNAs. Okay. So the next thing he wanted to know is, well, what about a real protein? This was a very um, artificial system with these 15 cysteine codons prepended to the firefly luciferase reporter. So to look at endogenous protein levels, Austin did a SILAC quantitative proteomic comparison, again, between the parental A549 cells and the dust two knockout cells. And what he saw here is that the proteins that are the most cysteine rich in the human proteome, these were proteins that were more than 5% cysteine, were significantly shifted down in abundance in the dust two knockout compared to the wild type. Okay, so in this SILAC proteomics, Austin couldn't see all proteins. And in fact, we couldn't see a very interesting class of proteins known as metallothionines. These are the most cysteine rich proteins in the human proteome. They're actually 35% cysteine. And the role of these cysteines um, is to coordinate binding of zinc. There are four major isoforms of metallothionines in human cells and they're very small proteins. And so we couldn't see these in the mass spec data. So Austin wanted to ask directly, are these most cysteine rich of endogenous proteins poorly translated in the dust two knockout cells? And so he used the same reporter with FLUC and RLUC, but now instead of the artificial cysteine rich repeat sequence, he prepended the coding sequence of endogenous metallothionines. And here again, he saw that the knockout cells were less able to translate this native cysteine rich sequence compared to the parental cells that have dust two activity. And this was true for two different metallothionines. Now, coming back to the beginning of this segment, I told you that the dust two protein is overexpressed in lung tumors compared to healthy lung tissue, and that high expression of dust two predicts poor survival of lung cancer patients. And 
The metallothionine proteins are interesting in this context because they have been shown in other cancer cell lines to be important for the migratory capacity of cells, which is often connected to the tumor prognosis. And so in this case, this was a glioblastoma cell line that when it was depleted for the most highly expressed metallothionine in this cell line, Huavru et al. saw that the cells were less able to migrate. And so Austin did a similar experiment using a Boyden chamber assay, which is a, a way to test a cell line's migratory capacity. And so the way this works is you seed the cells into a chamber above a porous support, and you put a chemoattractant, in this case, a high concentration of fetal bovine serum. And then you ask how well do the cells migrate through the pores in this support to get to the chemoattractant. And here again, in both of the DUST2 knockout clones, Austin saw that the cells didn't migrate very well compared to the wild type. Now, I don't know if this is because of the metallothionine or not. It's just an intriguing connection at this point. Okay, so the highlights of what I've told you about Austin's project is that the dust to knockout cells, the lung cancer cell lines, I didn't show you, but they don't grow as well as wild type and they don't migrate very well. And when Austin looked at all of the tRNAs in the transcriptome, very surprisingly, he saw a really specific defect in just tRNA cysteine GCA. And this depletion of tRNA cysteine is functional he showed by a variety of reporter assays that there are problems translating cysteine codons and that cysteine-rich proteins are reduced by a quantitative proteomic assay. And so the big open question about this study is what is special about this one tRNA? When I introduced this work, I told you that Eric Fizicki's lab had characterized uh, dust two substrates exhaustively in budding yeast, and it modifies about 15 different tRNAs. So Austin is going to look at the other 14 and make sure that something very strange hasn't happened to the modification landscape of human tRNAs, but I don't think that's the explanation. So we want to know going forward, why is this one family of tRNAs critically dependent on dust two activity? All right, that's what I've got. I wanna acknowledge the people again. I told you about Nicole Martinez's work discovering pre-mRNA pseudorelation, and I told you about grad student Austin Draycott's work investigating the functions of dust two. And I would be happy to take some questions if there's a little bit of time. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, there's a few questions in the chat if you want to look through those. Yes, I see them. Let's see. Um, is there a heterogeneity in the number and sites of pseudorelation, um, pre-mRNA or mature mRNA? So that's a good question, Fabrice. Nicole has started to explore that by comparing the modification landscape of the chromatin-associated RNA to the mature polyadenylated RNA, and we don't know the answer to that yet. And we are definitely interested in the possibility that there could be cytoplasmic pseudorelation that might add new sites. Um, we did not look at mitochondrial tRNA. No, I don't think the migratory capacity is affected by the poor cell growth because the migration is looking before the cells have doubled. Um, how does two knockout leads to reduced cysteine tRNA expression is the question that is keeping me awake at night. Um, what we suspect is that there's a defect either at a step in the biogenesis or that the unmodified tRNA is for some reason unstable. And so um, to answer this question, Austin is getting help from Matt Simon's lab to do time-lapse seek and look at whether it's synthesis of the tRNA that is messed up in the absence of dust 2 or whether the tRNA is made and then rapidly turned over. And in either case, I don't know why this one tRNA cares. Um, let's see what else. In vivo RNA structure analysis of pre-mRNA. Um, I let me see if I can answer this question. Pseudouridine by itself doesn't affect most reverse transcriptases. You have to treat the RNA with the carbodiamide CMC in order to get RT to stop. So I don't think that you're 
structure probing data are contaminated by pseudouridine dependent RT stops. Um, I do think that pseudouridine both is preferentially deposited in structured regions because the tRNA modifying pseudouridine synthases recognize RNA folds. And we know that pseudouridine can affect the folding of RNA. So it's definitely interesting to consider where structures are compared to where pseudouridines are. Um, let's see, David, is the reduced translation of cis-rich proteins accompanied by increased degradation of their mRNAs? We're doing that now, and we're doing it in wild type and um, knockdown cells where the ribosome collision dependent mRNA decay pathway is inhibited. We do see that the mRNA steady state levels of many cysteine-rich proteins are down in the dust tube knockout cells. Austin uh, did that as a control for the proteomics, um, but we're interested in whether this is a slow translation dependent degradation. And finally, is there a potential complication in results due to PUS1 or PUS7 modification of U2? Hi, Eric. Nicole looked very carefully at U2 by a painful number of low throughput primer extensions. And as I think Yitao and maybe everybody else predicted, um, those modifications in the human cells are not affected by those tRNA modifying pseudouridine synthases, and they are predicted to be directed by a snow RNA. Although we haven't verified by knocking out the snow RNA that that is the case. Uh, finally, does mutation of a pseudouridine site affect splicing? We have not done that experiment in cells. Nicole has done it in extracts with in vitro splicing and the presence or absence of a single pseudouridine effect splicing. And that, I apologize if I missed anybody's questions. Thank you very much for these great questions. And I think it's time to turn it over to Antonio. Thanks, Wendy. Hello, everybody. So um, start sharing the screen. All right. Oops. So thank you, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to be here, where I'm seeing many of uh, of uh, all colleagues in the audience. And um, today, I'm going to tell you about the work that we do in my laboratory at Yale, where we are trying to understand and, and decipher the regulatory code that shapes gene expression in development. And to understand how post-transcriptional regulation is shaping development, we're using a universal transition that is called the maternal to cygotic transition, which is characterized by um, a, a silent uh, genome uh, after fertilization in the first hours of development. And during that time, development is controlled by maternally deposited RNAs and proteins. So the main mode of, of gene regulation is post-transcriptional. And um, these mechanisms which are conserved uh, or principles which are conserved throughout many um, systems allow us to uh, begin to understand and decipher which are the elements that control maternal uh, and mRNA decay and post-transcriptional regulation in general. And so I've shown uh, here a single uh, or two images of an in situ hybridization just to illustrate how dramatic uh, this post transcriptional regulation is in development, where you can see in situ hybridization for a particular mRNA, uh, and within just three hours, it undergoes complete uh, degradation um, after the onset of genome activation, which happens sometime in between these times. So um, as a way to, uh, to understand the different elements um, that are regulating um, mRNA decay and translation during this uh, system, we have developed different approaches. So during this talk, I'm going to give you a brief overview of, of, of two projects, uh, some vignettes of uh, recently published work, and I'll focus later on on one story that is currently unpublished which I would love to get your feedback on. So one way that we try to understand the different regulatory elements uh, in embryogenesis is to basically 
uh, do a massive parallel reporter assays. And this way, we just take the whole transcriptome, we break it into pieces, uh, put it in a reporter mRNA um, that then we can, uh, that has a large amount of complexity, we can in vitro transcribe and then inject into the embryo and ask what is the regulation of each of those transcripts at the level of translation and mRNA decay. So we have done this for several regions of the mRNA and in particular, um, we did it, um, we can then apply uh, after we see the elements that undergo decay and um, or stabilization or translation or repression, um, we can then apply machine learning approaches to then identify motifs or rules that are governing those elements. So this is some work that we uh, published a few years ago and just wanted to give you a brief overview. So when we did this using calling sequences or taking that massive parallel reporter assay into the calling sequence, what we found is that um, basically codons uh, play a very important role in the regulation of maternal uh, mRNAs uh, and this mechanism is conserved uh, across different uh, systems. And this was uh, also shown um, um, uh, and by the Presniak um, uh, paper in cell. Um, where you can see that based on tRNA availability, different codons will uh, uh, induce a different rate of mRNA decay. And this uh, process is really conserved across uh, multiple model systems that we looked at, indicating that this is a major mechanism through translation activation of these maternally deposited mRNAs is a major mechanism of post-transcriptional control in these uh, stages. Another element that has uh, caught our attention, uh, also inspired by, by Wendy's, but for a different modifications is M6A modification of the RNA. Um, so Cassie Contour, a few years back, um, decided to look at what is the effect of RNA modifications and in particular M6A on, on mRNA decay during this uh, universal process. And in fact, um, at that time, the dogma was that uh, the YTHDF readers of these uh, modifications uh, are specialized proteins that will, uh, depending on the protein that binds this M6A, will uh, induce a different fate. And it's been shown that some of these proteins are actually required, or an M6A modification is required for mRNA turnover across different processes, such as reprogramming in ESLs. So she decided to look through a mutant analysis uh, of different binding proteins, uh, in this case, three different white HDF uh, proteins and look at uh, the mechanism by which, uh, or the process that it affects in development. And just to give you a summary of this work that was re recently published, um, what she found is that contrary to the previous um, reports um, by the Chuan He uh, laboratory, where it seemed that um, it was, uh, this process was regulated by primarily one YTHDF protein. She found that this process is actually uh, quite redundant and all three different um, YTHDF proteins uh, can function um, redundantly in, in this process in development. And in particular, it seems that M6A really triggers an, an increase in maternal mRNA uh, deadenylation. So just to show you one example here where, um, uh, sorry, keep switching back and forth. Um, this is a cumulative distribution that looks at the behaviors of mRNAs that don't have um, or have not been identified to be modified by M6A in gray, those that are um, uh, methylated only. Um, and you can see how there is an increase in the degradation, excuse me, increase in the degradation of those mRNAs uh, compared to the um, unmodified mRNAs. This effect is similar to the effect of uh, microRNA, um, which we showed several years ago that is involved in the regulation of, of a significant fraction of maternal mRNAs. And what we also show is that both the microRNA, MIR430 and M6A can actually work um, independently, but additively because those mRNAs that uh, have both MIR430 targets as well as, um, as uh, M6A modifications in the mRNA are degraded uh, much more rapidly. So this really allows a 
a system to the embryo to uh, regulate with different intensity the level of decay of these mRNAs as development proceeds. So as a summary of this part, what um, um, Cassie showed is that the effect of M6A indeed has a, a significant effect on mRNA deadenylation. However, uh, the different readers um, seem to work redundantly as it's been shown uh, more recently by these two different papers um, uh, as well. So clearly many of these elements can work uh, additively or cooperatively. Um, and we were interested in understanding what is the relative contribution of each of the features in the mRNA and uh, whether by looking at the regulation of endogenous mRNAs in addition to uh, the massive parallel reporters, whether we can identify new and common regulatory mechanisms uh, during this process. So this was a, a project that was taken uh, a few years back by Mario Messis, a computational biologist in the lab, uh, and Amir Mosef, an experimentalist. And basically what uh, Mario uh, did was uh, taking embryonic development and a tight time course of uh, mRNA expression. She then, he then clustered mRNAs in different groups depending on their behavior and identify enriched regulatory elements that were able to uh, or were correlated with a, a particular behavior of decay and stability, and then build a random fo forest model to identify the relative contribution of each of these elements. And then classify those elements of whether they were in the in the five prime, the calling sequence on the three prime UTR with the goal of identifying common elements. And he did this experiment actually in, in, in three different systems, in Zerofish, Senopus, and South Culture, uh, publicly available data. So, and several uh, themes emerged. So from the five prime ETR, um, so stability is shown here in blue and um, the stabilization is shown in red. And what you can see here, this is the time frame, and each of these squares represents the enrichment of these elements um, in the stabilization or decay across a different time point. So what you can see is uh, how um, the strength of uh, the Cossack sequence, excuse me, um, for example, is associated with stabilization, while the presence of up stream open reading frames, uh, both the length, the count, and the Cossack um, uh, score is associated with mRNA uh, decay. We found uh, a group of elements in the 3 prime ETR that were associated with uh, stability or decay. And as a positive control, he found uh, the MIR-430 seed site, which we had identified, as well as ARE elements that had been previously uh, described. And then he found a set of uh, both codons that promote stabilization as well as, um, as uh, amino acid stretches. Um, but uh, it caught our attention that one of the elements or one of the features that was associated with uh, mRNA decay was the, the length of the codon sequence. And that got us quite puzzled um, because we didn't see any clear reason why the length of the column sequence should be uh, associated with um, uh, faster decay. But indeed, um, after looking at different uh, model systems, we realized that this is a common feature and that we were just rediscovering um, uh, something that had been known in the literature, the association between the length of the column sequence, but the mechanism was uh, unclear. And through this analysis, he identified about more than 470 um, elements that appear to be uh, conserved across these different systems in regulating mRNA uh, half-life. So as I mentioned before, the, uh, the identification of the length of the coding sequence as being associated with mRNA decay um, is not new. And there are multiple studies that have uh, remarked this um, uh, association with mRNA stability, uh, but the mechanism, uh, it's not uh, clear. So with uh, Damir decided to go deep into this observation and try to understand what the mechanism uh, 
uh, for this regulation uh, would be. So the first thing that he did was to develop a set of reporters um, where it just takes um, the same um, coding sequence um, uh, with uh, several repeats of this coding sequence or a single repeat. Uh, so a what we will call a short versus a long coding sequence. They have the same five prime and three prime ETR, make in vitro transcribe mRNAs, inject them into zebrafish embryos and try to look at uh, the difference in mRNA stability. So this is just a description of the, of the approach. Um, and what he observed is that indeed, when you have a, a non-optimal mRNA that is long, it decays much faster than an optimal mRNA that is short. So in this case, the frequency of, of codons is the same uh, or very similar because you know, we have short five prime and three prime ETRs, but you can see that there is much stronger decay rate in the, in the long. However, in the case uh, of the optimal mRNAs, you see that the, um, the difference, while well, there is a slight difference between mRNA stability on the long and the short, uh, it's uh, much less um, uh, obvious. So it seems that indeed um, mRNAs that are longer decay much faster than those shorter mRNAs, um, uh, but what is the mechanism? So you can think of, of of different models, but here in just mentioning two, one is there might be an RNA binding protein that is somehow binding to the coding sequencing and, and measuring the length um, as well as uh, maybe the level of uh, translation and, and or naked RNA and the binding of this protein somehow um, enhances the level of, of decay. Alternatively, you could imagine, because we see that this phenomenon is uh, more uh, associated with um, non-optimal covens, you can imagine that the ribosome, as it's reading non-optimal uh, covens, is bringing a, a decay factor, um, and um, that this process in the longer um, mRNAs, you have a stronger or higher concentration of these factors, and that causes a higher rate of decay. So the mirror then decided to ask, well, is this process dependent on translation? Are the shorter mRNAs more stable uh, because they are uh, uh, being translated? So uh, you would imagine that this process might be independent of translation. Well, in this case, you would need the ribosome to come into the mRNA and bring these factors. So he did several experiments, but in particular, I'm just gonna mention one where he removed the um, um, star codon and the stop codons, as well as uh, near star codons in these reporters, and, and ask what do we still see a difference between the long and the short mRNAs? And while, so in, this is in the presence of the star codons, and you can see the, um, the long decays much faster, than, much faster than the short, but when he deletes the star codon, he sees a much um, rapid decay of the of the short mRNA, suggesting that somehow the, the ribosome might be protecting um, uh, these uh, mRNAs, uh, but is not bringing that uh, decay factor in, in this difference between the long and the short. So the moment we favor a model where maybe these proteins are binding uh, the RNA, and as the ribosome is translating, uh, you would imagine that these factors are being removed and the longer mRNAs might accumulate a higher uh, number of these factors that then engage the deadenylation or the decay machinery much more effectively. So um, if this is uh, the case, which is at the moment a model, um, how could we identify what factors are preferentially affecting the long uh, versus the short uh, coding sequences to, uh, to regulate the decay? So the mirror turned to publicly available data from in, in GIST. Um, and in particular, uh, we he analyzed uh, RNA expression um, um, in yeast. Um, from the Kramer lab, and um, in particular focus on the non-optimal genes uh, 
um, separated the long, the top uh, quartile of the long versus the short coding sequence, and observed that indeed the short uh, coding sequence um, have a longer half life that than the long uh, coding sequence, suggesting that, that this phenomenon appears to be conserved in yeast, and and this difference statistically significant. So the idea is that if we now look at uh, this amazing data set from the Kramer lab where they have looked at gene expression and mRNA half-life across 50 different uh, uh, knockout lines in yeast, um, we can then uh, look at the difference in half-life between the wild type and the different mutant lines and identify those mutants for which the difference between the long and the short uh, calling sequence uh, half-life is, um, is eliminated. So he focused his analysis uh, across the different parts of the mRNA, the decapping, uh, those uh, proteins that might bind the calling sequence in the 3 ETR and those proteins in the, the adenylation machinery. So when he did this uh, analysis, what he observed is that um, across the mutants for UPF2 and UPF3, you can see that the difference between long and short is not significant, suggesting that these proteins might be involved in creating the difference in mRNA stability between long and short. Um, similarly, when he uh, looked at um, the deadenylase complex, in both cases, uh, CCR4 and NAT3, he saw a loss of uh, significance between the long and the short mRNAs, while this difference was maintained, if not enhanced, for other deadenylase mutants like PAN2, PAN3, suggesting that maybe these two complexes are actually competing. And if you remove um, PAN2, PAN3, this effect might become. Uh, the effect of CCR4 not on long versus short might become stronger. So um, these uh, experiments uh, suggested or at least provided an a initial hypothesis that maybe these factors are somehow reading the effect of long versus short. And in mutants of these factors, the difference between long and short uh, mRNA decay is uh, abolished. And of course, this effect could also be associated with uh, uh, or correlated with other differences in, in, in these two groups of mRNAs. And Damir has actually looked at um, other different effects such as translation, um, and he doesn't see the, the, same, uh, the same level of correlation. So at the moment, uh, the current model is that we might have UPF proteins that are associated um, both in the common sequence and in the 3' ETR, and especially for those mRNAs that are poorly translated um, uh, or longer, you might have strong accumulation or stronger residency time of the UPFs in the mRNA, and this might engage the decay machinery. So if this was the case, um, and UPFs has some preference for binding from the coding sequence, which from the experiments from Lim Maquat in, in wild type RNAs is being mainly observed binding in the 3 ETR. But when you remove um, translation, you see that UPF protein is also accumulated in the coding sequence. So if this model is correct, you would imagine that maybe a, a presence of coding sequences behind the stop coron uh, might increase the rate of decay. So we turn to our um, massive parallel reporter assay and, and ask whether um, uh, we see a difference between coding sequence and 3 prime ETR sequence when they are placing behind the stop coron in the 3 prime ETR. So this uh, approach that we call RISA, where we take uh, uh, random fragments of the transcriptome, we place them in the 3 prime ETR, and these yeah, are both containing- I can't hear you right now. Uh, coding sequence and um, 3 prime ETRs, then inject them in vitro transcribing mRNA into the embryo, and then uh, over time look at the rate of decay uh, by quantifying the presence of these reporters at different times uh, in development. So what you would see is uh, those elements that promote stability would be labeled in blue, while those elements that promote decay would be labeled in red. And what you can observe here through this set of uh, reporters that contain between um, 500 base pairs and one KB, uh, 
between coding sequence and 3 prime ETR is that you see a set of regions that clearly promote mRNA decay when present in the 3 prime ETR, while another set of regions uh, promote mostly stability with small islands of decay, which are actually MIR430 target sites. So this is in this line, I'm labeling the stop coron. Uh, so you can see that those fragments that were derived from the coding sequence prim primarily promoted decay, while those fragments that were derived from the uh, 3 prime ETR primarily promoted uh, mRNA stabilization. So this is still a work in progress and I would love your feedback, uh, but currently what uh, Damir is, uh, is really trying to understand is whether, uh, what is the bias of UPF binding for highly and lowly translated mRNAs as well as for long versus short, and also measuring the binding of UPF across this library to see whether we observe a stronger binding of UPF in these sequences versus these sequences as a factor that could explain different decay of the column Sir, versus the three prime ETR. So the conclusions finally is that we think that long open reading frame leads to a stronger mRNA decay. Uh, we think that uh, translation could be the driving force that evicts these proteins that act as a, as a homeostatic mechanisms to regulate mRNA stability depending on the length of the coding sequence and the level of translation. And we think that UPF proteins uh, could be preferentially targeting long open reading frames for uh, long um, uh, coding sequences for mRNA decay, especially if those um, coding sequences are poorly translated, and hence the uh, stro stronger effect on, on non-optimal uh, column containing sequences. And I think there are several implications. Um, we think that uh, long and poorly translated mRNAs will be uh, more strongly destabilized based on this mechanism. We think that um, you know, exposed open reading frames uh, will lead to decay and this provides a mechanism to uh, detect those mRNAs, uh, as well as uh, my explain the mechanism by which you um, upstream open reading frame containing mRNAs, which are about 50% of all transcripts are actually more strongly degraded um, when they contain upstream open reading frames than when they don't. Because in those that, um, that translate the upstream open reading frame and that prevents from the translation of the main open reading frame, you might have an accumulation of some of these sensors that target mRNA for increased uh, decay. And you know, as it's been proposed uh, by Lim McQuad and others, uh, we think that this is another dimension by which um, proteins such as UPF, uh, UPF one, two, and three could regulate mRNA decay beyond NMD. So, just summary: um, I think through the analysis of the maternal to psychotic transition, I think we are trying to understand common regulatory mechanisms, as I've shown initially in the um, a summary of how common optimality regulates uh, decay of, of maternal mRNAs across uh, many different um, systems, how M6A is important in the clearance of maternal mRNAs and how this mechanism works additive uh, with microRNAs. And, and currently we are also studying RNA structures and the effect of the different regulatory sequences on mRNA translation. I don't know what's going on with my mouse. So uh, finally, I wanna thank uh, everybody uh, in the laboratory for a really a great team. And in particular, Cassie Contour, who just defended her thesis on the work on M6A. Um, Damir Moussef, uh, Musaf, who has done the work on length of the coding sequence together with Mario Messis and other uh, members of the lab. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Antonio. There's a few questions in the chat if you want to look at them or I can read them to you. Uh, let me see. So I, I'm having a hard time to understand where it starts though. It was started at 4.49 was the first question. Okay. Perfect. 449, okay. Repeat that the high degree of repeats in your construct rather than the length of the mRNA is the cause of decay. I mean, so um, 
so is the is the the rate of decay the high degree of repeats i think at the moment these are uh, sequences are only repeated uh, between three and six times and and it happens across different uh, repeats i think we have looked for um, the fact that these rnas will not make great uh, big structures and what we see for example is that the um, effect is is abolished uh, when we uh, block translation. So, so we don't think is due to the presence of repeats, but it's something that we, we will uh, pay more attention. So the, the only thing is that we are trying to control for the presence of different uh, regulatory motifs. So we wanna uh, make sure that we can compare the long and the short sequence. The fact is that when we go to yeast, these are endogenous mRNAs, and we have observed the same thing across Xenopus and zebrafish and, and human cells. So we don't think that this, this also happens for endogenous mRNAs. Longer calling sequence are degraded uh, faster, especially if they are um, um, uh, non-optimal. Um, so does the high CG content correlate with mRNA stability uh, uh, the five prime ETR, uh, but works. In, yeah, so so GC content in the five prime ETR uh, it promotes stability. I think in that case, um, what we think is that high GC content in the three prime ETR is, for the most part, abnormal, and I think this provides a mechanism to either detect lowly translated mRNAs. Um, or calling sequences that are present in the three prime ETR. Uh, in the case of the five prime ETR, with the constant scanning of the ribosome uh, subunits, I think, and the helicases, I think that if UPF were to bind there, I think it would be more readily evicted. That's a, a, at the moment our uh, our working model. So how do we expect this trend translated to law non-coding RNA? So, um, so what we observe is that, let's say if we remove the stop codons um, uh, or the star codons, we see that those mRNAs are less, um, less, much less stable. And so clearly transla translation to some extent promotes stability. Um, in the case of long non-coding RNAs, in many cases, we have seen that long non-coding RNAs that are not translated, uh, in some cases tend to be quite unstable. So I think that in this case, UPF proteins, if this is the mechanism, would bind these long non-coding RNAs and would uh, promote the um, increased decay. Um, but that is something that we haven't looked uh, in detail. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, Uh, does a high CG counter correlate with mRNA stability? Uh, I think I'm seeing re repeat questions, sorry. Um, so have we applied long read sequencing? Uh, we haven't yet actually uh, long read sequencing to study um, mRNA decay. And, but I think that's uh, especially with nanopore um, it's very promising because it might allow us to detect other signatures in the mRNA that might um, be enriched in mRNAs that are more rapidly decayed. So I think that's a great idea. System. Thank you. Um, high degree of the construct. So yes, I think this is something that uh, because we see it in the endogenous mRNAs, the high degree of repeats uh, might not be um, uh, might not be the case, but several people are suggesting and uh, we will look more in, in detail. Um, so could um, the longer open reading frames cause a higher risk of ribosome collisions? So that's certainly the case. Um, the fact that we see a rapid decay, even when we remove the AUGs um, suggests that uh, even though it could be a parallel method uh, model, uh, suggests that it's not strictly dependent on the ribosome as the ribosome being a positive factor. Because when we remove translation, 
um, we see very rapid uh, decay as well. Um, so this is a model that we were contemplating at the very beginning. Uh, so we think that is more the ribosome acts as a positive factor evicting um, evicting this uh, negative reader. Uh, but that's certainly a parallel mechanism that also plays a role, especially considering the, the non-optimal um, columns. Uh, so that's the UPF1 mediate effect of the stabilizing long open ready frame mRNAs dependence MAC1. So um, I don't remember exactly. I think that um, uh, we need to go back to the data. Um, I don't know whether we have access to SMAC1 in yeast, but it's something that um, I will need to get back to you, Lynn. But that's a, that's a, that's a great point, and we will, we will look farther into that from these data or, or maybe in our cell culture system or in the fish system to see what is dependent on SMOG1. Thank you. Um, mRNA in development. Well, I don't, so somebody asked me, is this specific for mRNA in development? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, yeah, we see it in, in cell culture. Um, through publicly available data, we say we use so um, the, the process of development we use is mainly to uh, basically use a system where um, post transcription regulation is the main method of, of regulation because there is no transcription. But we hope that this, as we found in the case of carbon optimality and, and, and other or micro mediated deadenylation, I think these are hopefully um, general mechanisms of re regulation. So do we think that UPF proteins uh, on ARFs will be removed by translating ribosomes? Do you think that UPF functions independently of translation termination? Um, we haven't looked at whether it functions independent of translation termination. We think that, as you point out, um, um, Dr. Kurosaki, is that the UPFs will be removed by the translating ribosomes. So, those that are, have longer coding sequence with lower translation uh, efficiency might have a more inefficient removal or a more efficient rebinding of the UPF proteins. Uh, but we haven't looked in relationship with translation termination. I mean, in the case where we have the three prime UTRs um, uh, with coding sequences after the stop codon, we see that this mechanism or we see a higher decay of those mRNAs that contain the calling sequence in the 3 prime UTR. So we think that this, um, uh, that this might function independent of termination. Um, so I read that the mRNA sequence DN is possibly deadly. Uh, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I don't quite understand the last question, but um, you can get back to me if you have further questions. Thank you so much, Antonio. We're a little bit over time. So if you have any other questions, yeah, please feel free to reach out to our speakers. And to me, if you have any questions about the Yale RNA Center. And thank you, Wendy and Antonio again for sharing today. And thank you everyone for attending. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback.